And I, we got seven o'clock in North Dakota, so it's time to begin our study for the evening. And um, we will be picking up with where we left off last week and finishing up with lesson 38. And we will pick up with lesson 39 tonight near the last part of the class. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get started with our study. Let me get the screen that I want up here. There we go. We'll pick up with our study of prayer after a, an opening prayer. So let's uh, prepare ourselves for the study of God's word. I trust that you have done so. And um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, again, we've come to feast on your word. And so I pray, Father, as we continue our study of, of the Doctrinal truths related to the spiritual body of Christ. We've had about four lessons thus far, I think, and one or two more before we actually finish all that the Word of God has to say regarding the spiritual body of Christ and our our responsibility as uh, members of that spiritual body of Christ, how we should live and other things involved with it. And so tonight we will pick up our study that we started last week regarding the service and stewardship of the spiritual body of Christ and continue on tonight with uh, the worship and prayer and thanksgiving. And we we'll trust that you will guide us tonight, the Holy Spirit, just pray that all who are listening, listening with a desire to learn, believing that the Spirit will teach if we have the desire to learn. So thank you again for this night. Glorify yourself in our time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we finished the um, aspect of the service and stewardship related to the spiritual body of Christ. And then last week, finished that part way through, and then we began uh, part one of her worship and prayer and thanksgiving. And so we spent most of the time uh, last week regarding prayer, starting with prayer in the first advent and uh, Christ's prayer, and we saw that the Lord's Prayer given in Matthew 6 is not really uh, the prayer for you and I as Christians today. That was the disciples' prayer uh, in Matthew 6. But yet, John 17 was, in fact, uh, the true Lord's Prayer that relates to you and I as Christians today. It had relation to those who had followed Jesus Christ at that time and to those who would come to salvation as a result of the work of those disciples and many others who have come since that time. And so um, we uh, finished the lessons there, and then we came last week to the prayer of thanksgiving. And so that's where we'll pick up tonight with the prayer of Thanksgiving. True thanksgiving is the voluntary expression of heartfelt. Get my. True thanksgiving is the voluntary expression of heartfelt gratitude for benefit received. Benefit received. It is effectiveness. Its effectiveness depends upon its sincerity and its intensity depends upon the value which is placed upon the benefit 
received. Second Corinthians 9.11. Paul writes, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving is peculiarly personal. There are obligations belonging to us, which may be assumed by another, but no one can offer for us our word of thanksgiving. Leviticus 22, 29, when you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. So that was the sacrifice of thanksgiving during the law. And that is true even with our prayer of thanksgiving now. Thanksgiving is in no way a payment for the benefit received. It is rather a gracious acknowledgement of the fact that the one who had received the benefit is indebted to the giver. Since no payment can be made to God for his unmeasured and uncounted benefits, the obligation to be thankful to him is stated throughout scriptures. And all thanksgiving is closely related to worship and praise. Under the old order, the spiritual relationship to God was expressed in material ways. Among these, provision was made for the offering or sacrifice of thanksgiving, as we read in Leviticus 7, verse 12. If he offers it by way of thanksgiving, then along with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, he shall offer unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil and cakes of well-stirred fine flour mixed with oil. Then in verse 13, with the sacrifice of this peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall present his offering with cakes of leavened bread. And then it goes on in verse 15. Now, as for the flesh of the sacrifice of his thanksgiving peace offerings, it shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it over until morning. And then the psalmist writes in Psalm 107, verse 22, let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. And then Psalm 116, verse 17. <clears throat> yes, tea here. Psalm 116, 17. To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Similarly, in this age, it is the privilege of the believer to make sacrificial offerings of thanksgiving to God. However, if while offering the thanksgiving gift of thanksgiving, the motive should include the thought of compensation, the essential value of thanksgiving is destroyed. The subject of prayer is mentioned many times in the Old Testament and frequently in the Psalms. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, explicit direction is given for the Thanksgiving offerings, as we just read in Leviticus 7, 12 to 15. Praise and thanksgiving were especially emphasized in the revival under Nehemiah. Excuse me. Praise and thanksgiving were especially emphasized in the revival under Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 12, verses 24 to 40. Likewise, the prophetic message of the Old Testament anticipates Thanksgiving as a special feature of worship in the coming kingdom. Isaiah 51, 3. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and her wilderness. He will make like Eden, 
and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and sound of a melody. And Jeremiah 30, 19. From them will proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who celebrate. And I will multiply them and they will not be diminished. I will also honor them and they will not be insignificant. So also, there is ceaseless thanksgiving in heaven, according to scripture, Revelation 4, 9. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. And Revelation 7, 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to you our God forever and ever. Amen. And Revelation eleven seventeen, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. An important feature of Old Testament thanksgiving is the appreciation of the person of God apart from all his benefits. As the psalmist writes in 30 verse 4, sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. And then in Psalm 95, 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Psalm 97, 12, be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Psalms 100, 1 to 5, a psalm of thanksgiving. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. And Psalms 119, 62. At midnight, I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. <clears throat> Excuse me again. <clears throat> got tea. Oh, here, I've got some water here as well. Excuse me while I drink some water. I've got a little gruffy voice. Okay. <clears throat> Though so constantly neglected, this theme of thanksgiving is most important, and such praise is reasonable and fitting. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, the psalmist writes, Psalm 92, 1. In the New Testament, the theme of thanksgiving is mentioned over 45 times. And this form of praise is offered for both temporal and spiritual blessing. Christ's unfailing practice, giving thanks for food, should prove an effectual example to all believers. As we read in Matthew 15, 36, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And Matthew 26, 27. And he had taken a cup. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. Mark 8, 6. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking, taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them. And started giving them to his disciples to serve them. And they served them to the people. Mark 14, 23. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. Luke 22, 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. And verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in John 6, 23, John records, there came under, they came, there came un, un, other small boats from Tiberias, 
near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we see there Christ gave thanks many, many times in those verses. And the apostle Paul was also faithful in his particular area of Thanksgiving, as we read in Acts 27, 35. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of Paul, and he broke it and began to eat. Romans 14, 6. He who observes the day, observe it to the, observe it to the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and give thanks to God. And 1 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from food, which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. Thanksgiving on the part of the Apostle Paul is worthy of close attention. He uses the phrase, thanks be unto God, in connection with Christ as the indescribable gift. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Concerning the victory over the grave, which is secured by the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of the present triumph, which is ours through Christ, read in 2 Corinthians 2.14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Paul's thanksgiving to God for believers. 1 Thessalonians 1.2, we give thanks to God always for you, for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. And to the Thessalonians, he writes in 1 Thessalonians 3, 9, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account. For Titus in particular, 2 Corinthians 8, 16, for thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus and Paul's exhortation that thanks be given for all men. And he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 1, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. And likewise, object lessons to all the children of God. Two important features of thanksgiving, according to the New Testament, should be noted. Thanksgiving should be prayer without ceasing. Since the adorable person of God is unchanged and his blessings never, benefits never cease. And since the abundant grace of God will redound to the glory of God through the thanksgiving of many, it is reasonable and thanksgiving be given to him without ceasing. 2 Corinthians 4.15, for all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Of this form of praise we read, by him therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of the lips giving thanks to his name. That's Hebrews 13, 15. We compare that verse to Ephesians 1, 16. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That's Paul speaking. He does not cease giving thanks for you, writing to the Ephesians, while making mention of you, the Ephesians, in my prayers. And Colossians 1, 3, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. 
His feature, Thanksgiving, is also emphasized in the Old Testament, Psalm 30, verse 12, that my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent, O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And in Psalm 79, 3, so we, your people and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever, to all generations who will tell of your praise. Psalm 107, 22, let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. And then Psalm 116, 17, to you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. So thanksgiving should be offered without ceasing. Thanksgiving should be offered for all things as stated in Ephesians 5.20, always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. We find a similar command in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And to the Philippians, Paul wrote in 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And Colossians 2, 7, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. And then Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Giving thanks always for all things is far removed from giving thanks sometimes for some things. However, Having accepted the truth that all things work together for good, them who love God, it is fitting that thanks be rendered to God for all things. Such God-honoring praise can be offered only by those who are saved, living in the sphere of the Spirit. As we read in Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled in the sphere of the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Daniel gave thanks to God in the face of the sentence of death. Daniel 6.10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his room, roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. And Jonah gave thanks to God from the belly of the great fish, and from the depths of the sea, Jonah 2, 9. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving, that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. The common sin of gratitude toward God is illustrated by one of the events recorded in the ministry of Christ. Ten lepers were cleansed, but only one returned to give thanks, and he was a Samaritan. As we read the story in Luke 17, beginning in verse 11, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. 
Then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. It should be noted here that ingratitude is a sin. Being included as one of the sins of the last days. The words of Paul to Second Timothy, to Timothy in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 2. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. This is Paul's testimony of in the last days. This is the way Christians will be living. It is probable that there is true sincerity on the part of many unsaved who try to be thankful to God for temporal benefits, but their utter failure to appreciate the gift of his son leaves them most unthankful in his sight. It should be remembered that Thanksgiving Day was established in the USA by believers and for believers and in recognition of the fact that the Christ rejected, rejecting sinner cannot give acceptable praise unto God. Well, that brings us to the end of this particular lesson, spiritual body of Christ regarding her worship in prayer and thanksgiving. And so before we go on to uh, lesson 39, let me uh, post the questions of this lesson so you can review the lessons later on in your time and search the lessons for the answers to these questions. So here we go. Question number one. What are the four sacrifices of the believer priest? What are the four sacrifices of the believer priests? Number two, what importance would you attach to the fact that praise is one of these four sacrifices? What importance would you attach to the fact that praise is one of these four sacrifices. Question three, how is worship related to form and circumstances? How is worship related to form and circumstances? Question four, what characterized prayer before the first coming of Christ? What characterized prayer before the first coming? Of Christ. Five. What was the purpose of the Lord's Prayer as stated in Matthew 6, 9 to 13? What was the purpose of the Lord's Prayer as stated in Matthew 6, 9 to 13? In what sense is it proper for us to pray for the kingdom to come? In what sense is it proper for us to pray? For the kingdom to come. Why should John 17 be regarded as the true Lord's Prayer? Why should John 17 be regarded as the true Lord's Prayer? Question 8. What do we learn in scripture concerning the prayer life of Christ? And how does John 17 indicate this form of his petitions? Question eight, what do we learn in scripture concerning the prayer life of Christ? And how does John 17 indicate the form of his petitions? Number nine, why under the present dispensation of grace does the function of prayer include intercession in view of God's omniscience? Why under the present dispensation of grace does the function of prayer include intercession in view of of God's omniscience. And 10, why are the twin, what are the twin dangers pointed out by James? <clears throat> Excuse me. What are the twin dangers pointed out by James in relation to prayer? What are the twin dangers pointed out by James in relation to prayer? 
What is the unlimited scope of prayer under grace? What is the unlimited scope of prayer under grace? How does the spirit relate to our petitions? How does the spirit relate to our petitions? What are the dangers? Number 13, what are the dangers on the one hand of irregular prayer time and on the other hand of useless repetitions? What are the dangers on the one hand of irregular prayer time and on the other hand of useless repetitions? 14, why should prayer under grace be offered to the Father in the name of the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why should prayer under grace be offered to the Father in the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit? 15. Why is thanksgiving to God a personal matter? Why is thanksgiving to God a personal matter? 16. In what sense is thanksgiving a sacrifice? What sense is thanksgiving a sacrifice? 17. How does thanksgiving relate to the person of God as in contrast with his works? How does thanksgiving relate to the person of God as in contrast with his works? 18. What are some of the outstanding illustrations of thanksgiving in the New Testament? What are some of the outstanding illustrations of thanksgiving in the New Testament? 19, what two important features of thanksgiving are noted in the New Testament? What two important features of thanksgiving are noted in the New Testament? 20, why is failure to give thanksgiving a sin? Why is failure? to give thanksgiving a sin. Anyone, why is thanksgiving properly offered only by believers? Why is thanksgiving properly offered only by believers? And so there's the questions for lesson 38. And now let me go to the other Lesson we'll pick up tonight, and that is major Bible theme number 39. I need to go down here. There it is. Christianity, body of Christ, your organization, and ordinances spiritual body of christ her ordinances organization and ordinances well in this lesson we're going to use the word church a lot because it's talking about the organized church not the spiritual body of christ so uh, we'll see the use of the word church that's I've taught that in previous lessons, how a church doesn't always refer to the true spiritual body of Christ, as we'll see as we get into these le this lesson. So the first thing we'll consider is church government. The church, as the spiritual body of Christ, includes every Christian joined to Christ around the world as that Christ being the head of the body, and we are all joined to Christ as a result of the baptism of the Spirit. Joined to Christ at the moment, faith alone and Christ alone. So this statement is related to the spiritual body of Christ. It may not be true of every person who gathers in an organized church anywhere in the world. The church as an organism is ordered on the same principle as the human body. 
where each part relates to each other, to each other part, and the whole body relates to the head delegating the body. Now, this is the this is the spiritual body of Christ. Spiritual body of Christ as an organism is ordered on the same principle as the human body, which each part relates to each other part. And the whole body relates to the head directing the body. The body of Christ essentially needs no organization, none, as its relationship is spiritual and supernatural. The local church, however, Biblical times as well as today, some church organization seems to be necessary in practice. Three forms of church government are found in the history of the church, each having its roots in apostolic times. Three forms, and we'll consider these three forms. First, we have the Episcopalian form of government that recognizes a bishop or church leader by some other designation who has power by virtue of his office of directing the local church. This has developed into an extensive organization such as is true in the Roman Catholic Church or a more simple system as found in the Episcopalian Church or the Methodist Episcopal body, where bishops are appointed to supervise the activities of the churches in a given area, the Episcopalian form of government, form of the the church, church government. A representative form of church government recognizes the authority of duly appointed representatives of local churches, usually grouped geographically, and is illustrated in the Reformed and Presbyterian, excuse me, Presbyterian churches. Often representatives of a local group or presbytery of churches come under the supervision and direction of a larger body or synod. And in turn, the synod comes under the larger body of a general assembly. While rules and extent of power vary, the idea is that duly appointed representatives constitute the authority of the church. Third, we have the congregational form of government. This form of government is where the seat of authority is in the local congregation and important matters are decided by the congregation without respect to authority of other churches or officials. Illustrating this form of government are congregational churches such as the United Church of Christ, the Disciples, churches and the Baptist churches. While local churches may be subject in some degree to higher bodies, committees or officials, the concept of a congregational church is that a local congregation determines its own affairs and elects and ordains its own ministers and directs the use of its own treasury. In the early church, all three forms of government are in evidence to some extent. Many of the early churches recognized the apostles as having primary authority. This seems to have passed, however, with the first generation of Christians. Representative government is illustrated in the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15, wherein the apostles and elders in Jerusalem were considered authoritative on the doctrinal questions which the church has raised. Strictly speaking, however, they were neither elected nor representatives of the church in the modern sense. As churches matured 
and no longer needed apostolic supervision. The government of the churches seems to have passed to each local church itself. This seems to have been true of the seven churches of Asia Minor of Revelation 2 3, which were subject to no human authority, although remaining under the authority of Christ himself. It is questionable whether scripture authorizes the extensive and complicated government sometimes appearing in the modern church. A return to biblical simplicity would seem in order. No doubt about it. Well, let's consider the order of the church. The concept of church relates to those who have authority in the local church and provide leadership for it. The local church in the New Testament included those designated as bishops and elders who were responsible leaders of the local church. It is probable that the bishops and elders were the same people, although the titles were slightly different in meaning. The concept of elder in the New Testament was probably derived from the elders who exercised authority over Israel and indicated a person who is mature in judgment and worthy of an authoritative position. As we read in Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from elders. And the Greek word translated elders in that passage is presbyteros. The elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Then we have in Matthew 26, 47. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12 came up accompanied by a large group with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. And there again, we have Old Testament or, or Jewish use of the word elders. And in the Greek, that again is presbyteros. Then we turn to Acts 4, 5. Uh, we also had those those who had seized Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest where the scribes and the elders, again, presbyteros, were carried or gathered together. Yeah. Then we turn to Acts 4, verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders, still talking about in Jerusalem now, and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. There we see that same Greek word presbyteros. In verse 23, when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So you see in all these verses we've just looked at, uh, this word elder is again, uh, it's, it's most probable that although we have churches today that Point elders. I'm believing that this idea of an elder comes from these gospel passages that we just read, talking about the rulers and elders of the Jews. And in, in that use, it is the word presbyteros. Hence, an elder was one who had the personal qualifications for leadership while the term bishops or overseer described the office or function of a person. A bishop was always an elder, but an elder might not be a bishop under certain circumstances. That is, he might have the qualities without the office. Normally, the terms seem to have been used in identical sense in the early church. As we read in Titus chapter one, verses five to seven, this reason I left you in Greece, Paul writing to Titus, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders. And we're still working off the, the Jewish concept. But appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And there is the word presbyteros again. 
Then verse 6, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. And verse 7, for the overseer, that is the bishop in the King James, overseer in the NAS, and it's the Greek word, epistemos, the Greek word, epistemos. And so it reads, for the overseers or bishop, if you're reading King James, must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not good-tempered, but addic not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond, fond of sordid gain. So in apostolic times, bishops and elders in the local church were, were plural, although some may have provided more leadership than others. Bishops and elders were charged with certain responsibilities, such as ruling the church. As Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 and 5, an overseer, and there's that word episcopus, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And then again to Timothy, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders, and here's that Greek word presbuteros again, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of full honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And so uh, we, we see the word elder as spoken of by Paul in his letter to Timothy. They were to protect the church from moral and theological error. As Titus writes in, Paul writes in Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. And they were, they were to superintend or oversee the church as a shepherd would his flock. John 21, 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd, my sheep, Greek word there for shepherd is poimenos, poimeno, poimenoso. Acts twenty twenty eight. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's episcopos, episcopos, to shepherd. I may know the church of God, which he purchased in his own blood. And the author of Hebrews writes in 1317, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And then 1 Peter 5.2, Shepherd, there's that word for menos again. Meno. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, episcopal. Episcopal, yep. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Although they were appointed by the apostles in the early church, it seems that as these churches matured, appointment was by the church itself, and such appointment was a recognition of their spiritual qualities, which qualified them for places of leadership, such as Acts 14, 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with, fa prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed.
Acts 20, 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And that's Titus 1.5. This reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And as we just read again, 1 Peter 5.2, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Now, in contrast with elders and bishops, others were designated deacons. In the early church, they concerned themselves with charity for the needy and ministering in physical things, although they could also have spiritual gifts. Acts 6, 1 to 6. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. That's the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Verse 4. But we will devote, our, devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the, of the word. The statement found a, approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip, and Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Ar Armenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. So these became, these became the, the servants, the deacons, and their purpose was to serve. Then we have 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife, and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Like the elders, they were set aside to their office by the apostles, as we read in Acts 6, 6. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. Acts 13, 3, <clears throat> then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. 2 Timothy 1, 6, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Or, they may have been appointed by the elders in the early church. First Timothy 4.14, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. As in the case of elders and bishops, distinction must be made between the office of being a deacon and the ministry which a deacon might perform. Philip is an illustration of one who held the office of a deacon, but who by spiritual gift was an evangelist. As we read in Acts 6, 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Armenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And then when we turn to Acts 2, 21, 8, 
On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. In the church today, some churches tend to recognize a single pastor as the elder and other officials who assist him in spiritual matters as deacons. This does not seem, however, to be based on biblical practice. The ordinances of the church is our next subject, and we'll get partially through this and call it a night, but we'll begin. Most Protestant churches recognize only two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Exceptions to this may be found in certain bodies who recognize foot washing as illustrated in Christ washing the disciples' feet. John 13 as another ordinance. The Roman Catholic Church adds a number of ordinances, only Baptist and the celebration of the Lord's Supper are almost universally recognized. I've, I've worked on this earlier today and it appears that my my new changes didn't get over to this other computer I'm working on, but we'll get started and we'll see if, if I can get through it here, um, even with this older version of Word. Um, only water baptism and the celebration of the Lord's Supper are almost universally recognized. Roman Catholic Church adds uh, several ordinances. So let's first turn to the doctrine of baptism, since uh, baptism is one of those ordinances that a lot of a lot of churches uh, practice. Uh, let's go with that. Doctrine of baptism. Hebrews 5, 11 through chapter 6, verse 3. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying out of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. In these verses, the believers in the first century Jerusalem were called down for the failure to mature in the faith. These believers who by now should have been teachers were still babes needed someone to teach them the basics of the word. The author of Hebrews urges these people to get past the elementary teachings and to press on to maturity. He then lists seven foundational doctrines that believers must understand if they ever hope to reach maturity. One of these is the doctrine of baptisms. The usage of the Greek word baptizo can be traced as far back as the ninth century BC. The words had two basic, the word had two basic meanings. To change the nature of something and to identify something with its purpose. The first meaning was employed by Homer in the Odyssey to describe the tempering 
of a sword. When the hot metal was plunged into water, the sword was baptized, meaning it changed from soft to hard metal. So that's the, that's the first use. When something does in fact change, that sword, when plunged into the hot water and into the water, is changed from soft metal to hard metal. The second meaning was used by the Spartans who would baptize their spears before a battle by dipping the tip of the spear in blood. This process did not change the physical characteristics of the weapon, but served as a picture of it becoming a battle spear, one that it tasted blood. Nine different baptisms are taught in the New Testament. Five of these baptisms are non-water baptisms, considered real baptisms in that a real change takes place, like the sword thrust into the water and the soft metal becomes hardened steel. And four of these are water baptisms considered ritual baptisms in which no change takes place, but something is simply identified with its purpose. So let's begin with the five non-water or real baptisms. The first is the baptism of Moses. We find that in 1 Corinthians 10, one and two. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In the baptism of Moses, Moses is identified with a cloud and the children of Israel are identified with Moses. The cloud is Jesus Christ. The people of the Exodus generation passed through the Red Sea from slavery to freedom. No one got wet. No one, but an actual change did take place. What's the change? Two and a half million slaves were identified with God's deliverer, Moses, and became free men. Baptism of Moses, number one of the five non-water baptisms or what we call real baptisms. Next we have the baptism of the cross, also called the baptism of the cup. We find this in Luke 12 verse 50. But I have a baptism to undergo, Jesus said, and now, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. And also in Matthew 20, 22, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. In the baptism of the cross, of the cup, when the sins of all men were poured out on Christ, the Lord was changed. He became sin. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. On the cross, when Jesus was identified with our sins, he was under condemnation, severed from God the Father. As we read in Matthew 27, 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? One of the results of the baptism of the cross is that the believer 
is healed by his wounds. As Peter writes, 1 Peter 2.24, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Third, we have the baptism of the present age believer by the Holy Spirit into Jesus. This is one of the two baptisms that are referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The change that takes place that at the moment of salvation, the believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit by changing him from being identified in Adam to being identified in Christ. We are all born in Adam, condemned. And we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For all, whereas in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes us out of Adam and places us into Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Romans 6, 3, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Galatians 3.27. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Next, we have baptism of the church age believer by Jesus with the Holy Spirit. This is the second of two baptisms that are referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The change that takes place is that at the moment of salvation, Jesus Christ baptizes the believer with the Holy Spirit by placing the Holy Spirit inside the believer's human spirit permanently. It's a picture of that. We are as human beings, with a body and a soul, and a body is totally infected with the sin nature. Now, according to Titus chapter three, verses five and six, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which he, we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our savior. So at the moment we've placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Titus, the Holy Spirit is going to re regenerate or revive our dead human spirit. And once that human spirit is revived, according to Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist said that Jesus, when he comes, would baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so the moment we become saved, that prophecy by John is fulfilled. Jesus baptizes the believer with the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? <clears throat> Excuse me. And that brings us to the fifth non-water real baptism, the baptism of fire. We read in Matthew 3.11, we just read it, Again, John says, as for me, I baptize you with 
waters for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and he will baptize you with fire. Luke 3, 16, we read the same. John answered and said to all of them, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He, that is Jesus Christ, will baptize you, the believer, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In the coming baptism of fire, all unbelievers will be identified with the fire of judgment. A permanent change will take place at the second advent when unbelievers are removed from the earth and sent to eternal destruction. As we read in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And of course, uh, too detailed to read, but Revelation 14 through Revelation 19 uh, will talks about uh, this baptism of fire, this judgment that's going to take place on humanity. We also read in Ezekiel 20, 34, of the baptism of fire for unbelieving Jews. That's the focus of this passage, baptism of fire for unbelieving Jews. Ezekiel wrote, and I shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I shall enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will enter into judgment with you declares the Lord God. And I shall make you pass under the rod and I shall bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I shall purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I shall bring them out of the land where they sojourn, that they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus, they will know that I am Lord. Isaiah 1, verses 25 to 27, also speaks of the Jewish the baptism of fire. Isaiah writes, I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye, and will remove all your alloy. Then I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, and her repentant ones with righteousness. When we turn to Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, Behold, I am going to send my messenger. And he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he will sit as a smelter and purifier, purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may be present to the Lord. They may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, 
For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Well, when you read through that passage, you can, you can sense uh, the Lord just taking it out on, on Israel, those sinning Israelis. And verse 6 is so powerful. For I, the Lord, do not change. He's reminding Jerusalem. That he is immutable. He does not change. Therefore, O sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. He's saying, you better be thankful that I am an immutable Lord. It's based on what I see, you would be consumed. But I don't change. Therefore, you will get through. Righteous ones will get through. And in Malachi 4, 1 to 3, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. The verses that address the baptism of fire for Israel. The baptism of fire for unbelieving Gentiles is the focus of Matthew 25, 31 to 46. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These are the believers. And I, I say they're Gentile believers because it says in verse 32, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Now, now, that generally is nations other than Israel. We've already seen the prophecies regarding the baptism of fire for Israel in those Old Testaments we read, Old Testament passages. So then, when Jesus returns and sits on his glorious throne, he will gather all the non-Jewish nations, that's the Gentiles, will gather them. So in verse 34, come you Gentiles who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he goes on, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, the righteous Gentiles will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Now, these, this, these verses are in Matthew 25. These are talking about the answering the disciples' question when they asked them, what will be the sign of the end of the age and what will be the sign of your coming? And we are reading what part of that answer that Jesus gave his disciples here in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. So this is what's going to take place regarding the Gentiles when he comes to establish his kingdom and he and he the baptism of fire removes all the unbelievers from the earth. He casts them into hell and eventually into the lake of fire. We saw the passages regarding the Israelites and their cleansing from Israel, and 
Now we've seen the Gentiles, the first part of the Gentiles, the believers who will go into the kingdom. But then he goes on. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me. Cursed ones into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison. You did not visit me. Then they, the unbelieving Gentiles will ask, will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. He's talking here about the Gentiles during the tribulation period. While the Jews were going around with evangelizing. Many Gentiles heard and believed. Many Gentiles did not. It's here in Matthew 25, 31 to 46, where we are reading of the judgment of those Gentiles. And they were judged based on how they responded to the Jews who brought them the gospel message for salvation. Those who accepted it were brought into the kingdom, as we saw in the first part of the reading, Matthew 25, 31, 31 through 40. Then in verse 41, he turns to those on his left, the unbelieving Gentiles, who throughout the seven-year tribulation, while the Jews, 144,000 Jews, were evangelizing, they rejected the Jews when they came to them with the message. And these, verse 46, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there we have the five non-water baptisms. Baptism of Moses, the baptism of the cross, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, placing the believer into Christ, baptism of the Holy Spirit, where Christ places the regenerated soul, places the Holy Spirit in the regenerated soul of the new believer permanently. And then we have this fifth non-water real baptism, the baptism of fire. So we haven't got enough time left to continue on in the lessons and complete the four ritual baptisms. And so we'll start here uh, at our next lesson next week and finish out this lesson regarding the spiritual body of Christ, her organization and her ordinances. And we've been working through uh, the one ordinance of Baptism, water baptism, and then we'll pick up uh, the second ordinance of the Lord's Supper when we come back. So, with that, let me close with prayer. Father, thank you once again for our time together tonight as we continue to study spiritual body of Christ and those things that relate to each of us as members of the spiritual body of Christ. We finished our lesson on uh, worship having to do with, with prayer and thanksgiving. And we've now moved into the organization and ordinances of uh, the, the churches that are organized. There really is no organization earthly with the spiritual body of Christ. There is spiritually, as we are all members of the one body, 
body of Christ. So thank you for the study tonight. And I just pray that those who have attended now and those who will attend through YouTube later on um, will be will be open to the truth as we've studied tonight. Praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, folks, for being with me, and we'll see you next week.